Oh yeah, no, it never occurred to me to ever question that birth control was a great thing. Like I saw that as when I, in my, you know, I saw that as, I remember to quote my former self, saying <laughs> things like, you know, birth control is the linchpin to a woman's freedom right. or woman's health, you know. So I was, yep. you know, very much on that. Um, and, I, and I got there not from doing research, really. I mean, I, it was also never questioned, but um, I think when you kind of join an ideology, in some ways it comes as a prepackaged whole. Yeah. And you kind of accept it. With contraception, I was always sort of, I, I was never really taught to be critical of it. But abortion, you know, I grew up in a very anti-abortion, a pro-life household. And I felt, you know, I, I sort of was sympathetic with that view very long into my feminist years. And then it switched. And it didn't switch because I did research. It didn't switch because I followed the intellectual arguments. It just switched. And all of a sudden, I had a very emotionally intense um, reaction against pro-lifers. Why was that? Because as think, you say, you didn't follow the thread. No, I think it's because once you sort of join a, mo a group, a kind of an ideological movement, um, you know, may, you know it, it often it, it comes as sort of a prepackaged whole. I think we see this a lot in American politics, yeah. right? Like, oh, well, you're a liberal. Here, Here's, these are yeah. the things you believe. These and, are and the things you, concede, you should feel outraged about. If you concede any points to the opposition, then you're a traitor. And so you must adopt everything within that right. party. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so I was totally fine with contraception. Um, yeah, this is important, I think, for us to understand <clears throat> as Catholics who wish to evangelize to understand where people are coming from, mm -hmm. because I am yeah. all of a sudden getting a lot more of a uh, more sort of sympathy mm -hmm. for those who tell me how necessary contraception is for right. the autonomy of women and to attack it. I, I, but then you said you didn't really think this through either. Right. So did you think, well, when people attack contraception and abortion, even if they say abortion is murder, this is an attack on my autonomy? Mm -hmm. Did you think of it that way? Like, um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think for one thing, I, you know, I think feminism takes the, the supreme value of autonomy for granted. Like that's, that's really a primary value mm. for, you know, for feminists is autonomy. Um, and so here, let me, let me give an example. And this is, um, there was this Facebook post that I saw, and this was after I became Catholic, when I was beginning to start to um, list, you know, entertain questions I'd never allowed myself to entertain before. Um, and there, and it's funny this popped on my feed. This was a friend of a friend, not someone I know personally, but she was, she posted that she, um, was having, about having an abortion, and she's, it, the post said something like, this is the second time I've gotten pregnant on long, on like long-term um, hormonal birth control, um, and you know, I'm not ready to be a mother now, and so I'm having an abortion, and you know, this is why abortion is so necessary. Um, mm. be, you know, bodily autonomy, I think that she used the phrase, bodily autonomy exists for a reason. And what, what struck me when I read that is that, ironically, her very situation demonstrates that bodily autonomy does not exist for women in the same way that it exists for men. Mm. Right? So she was using contraception, um, but she still got pregnant anyway. Right? So who, who forced that pregnancy on her? It's her own body. Mm. Right? So... You know, if, you, if a woman engages in sex, even if she tries to prevent a pregnancy from occurring, it can still happen, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for at least so for a woman being sexually active, bodily autonomy doesn't exist in this absolute sense the mm. way it does for men because of our, our distinctive reproductive right. roles and those realities, right? Yeah. So I think I was beginning to see that, um, that both contraception or abortion and abortion are part of this train of thinking that what freedom looks like is for women to become as much like men as possible. So rather than, say, trying to change certain aspects of society, like having um, generous maternity leave, for example, like most of the developed world, um, the, the solution um, to the problem of pregnancy has been um, to, for, for abortion, right, to get rid of it, mm -hmm. basically. Um, but this, I think I also overlooked, 
um, just especially with hormonal birth control, the, even just the physiological and emotional effects that women are taking on themselves. And I didn't really realize, because you know, birth control is talked about so positively, like it's nothing, like it's just you know, like eating a piece of candy, vitamin, and then yeah. you know you get to sort of do what you want without consequences, mm. you have vitamin. Um, but it's it's really significant what's happening because you're you're taking synthetic hormones in order to make one of your physiological sim symptoms intentionally malfunction. Wow. Right? So can you say that again? That was very Oh, well I don't put. know. <laughs> doesn't matter. We can just right, backspace yeah, yeah, yeah. on, yeah, yeah. on YouTube. But <laughs> yeah, but you're intentionally you're causing your body to malfunction. Yeah, and this is when people say, well, what's the difference between birth control? Like you're for like aspirin and Tylenol. But of course, the difference is with Tylenol, I'm taking it so that my body works correctly. I'm like, right. uh, yeah, I'm healing an right. ailment, not shutting down a function of my body. Exactly. And that's the difference, right? Um, so it's not, and sometimes people misunderstand the Catholic position that you know they're, you're against birth control because it's, it's artificial. Yeah. You know, like oh, what about glasses? Yeah. You know, but again, like well, when I, I have really terrible eyesight, so I'm wearing contacts right now, and that's enabling my my eyeballs to yeah. function correctly. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's very it's very different, um, and yeah. So I, yeah, my views have changed a lot on contraception. And in, you know, surprisingly, in ways like my views on contraception and abortion now, in many ways are you know they have theological and philosophical basis, but they, I also genuinely think that it's it's bad for women. Okay, why is contraception bad for women? Because it creates a culture where women are expected to be sexually available to men, mm -hmm. and to act as if they have complete bodily autonomy even while engaging in sex. But when that the reality of female biology rears its head, it's women who carry the burden of that. I see. So once a woman becomes pregnant, sure she can get an abortion, but that's not like, you know, going and getting a teeth cleaned, you know, yeah. teeth cleaned or something. Like it's, do you think she, that's, do you she think... imposes that bodily autonomy violently on herself, right? Mm. So that's what we're asking women to do. We're saying- Do you think that's why yeah. women want to make it seem, some women who are pro-abortion want to make it seem like it's not a big deal? Uh, you know, because you just said it's not good for women because they're expected to be sexually available. And then the woman says, well, I want to be sexually available and this right. affords me that. And you say, yes, but your femininity, your, your, the reality of your biology will rear its head and then you have to do this thing and that's a big deal. And then they have to say, well, it's not a big deal. It is just like getting my teeth cleaned. It's almost like we have to, women have to lie or, to themselves. And so do men who maybe encourage their partner to, to have this abortion performed. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've, we have sort of embraced this myth that sex doesn't have anything to do with procreation. Right. right? Um, so, yeah, so I really see this as kind of um, um, a masculine or male model of reproduction yes. as being presented as the norm. And then women are now expected to do violence to their bodies in order to be able to exist in the world um, mm. and to be as sexually free as men, but then, you know, then it doesn't, it's not a utopia, right? So, because contraception is not, um, even in perfect use, it's not 100% effective. And in typical use, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20% mm -hmm. failure rates, right? And, and Depending this, on the method. So, uh, even just from a pragmatic, I'm not even talking theologically yet, I'm just yes. talking pragmatically. And here's the thing that's super interesting that I that really shocked me because um, there was a time when I was sort of like okay I was on board with the um, with the pro life when it comes to abortion but I was like but doesn't access to contraception reduce abortions like of course yeah. so how can as a Catholic how can I be against contraception when that's the sort of the thing that will reduce abortions but what's fascinating is that if you look at the research and you can even look at this the Guttmacher Institute which is the research arm of Planned Parenthood, so it's a very pro-choice um, organization, even their research indicates that once a society becomes contraceptive, abortion rates actually go up. They don't go down. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because sexual behavior changes. Mm. It becomes riskier, it becomes more casual. This so is why pumping unplanned... condoms into Africa isn't going exactly, to help. Right? Yeah. So unplanned pregnancies go up and abortion rates go up. Right. So that was, a, that was really shocking for me to realize that and to see that there's actually a correlation here because abortion essentially becomes backup contraception. Mm -hmm. Now, once a society is contraceptive, 
then there, there's an argument that contraception does reduce abortion rates, right? So mm -hmm. once sort of the cat's out of the bag, then it becomes um, a more complicated question, the relationship between those two things. But um, yeah, once I really began to see contraception and abortion as basically two sort of practical extensions of the same idea rather than contraception being the solution to abortion. Yeah. That's when that was part of my sort of change. Fruit of the same tree. Yes. And this, we haven't even begun talking about the detrimental health effects, like the, the fact that the oral contraceptive pill is a class one carcinogen. Right. Uh, and it, there, yeah. And in a day and age where we're all so intense about being natural, this is the one yes. thing we refuse to look at. Yes. I mean, no one has stopped. I mean, there's all these great Netflix videos about all the hormones that go into your food and right. eating right. healthy and being right. green, mm -hmm. but n we can't talk about that. You know? There was an interesting study recently that came out about um, a correlation between birth control and depression as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's a significant thing that we're sort of asking women to do. Yeah. Um, and, and it's true, some women, like I did for years, you know, will say, look, I'm not being forced to, to want this. I'm not being forced to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, like, I want to, you know, you know function in the world as a man when it right. comes, comes to sexuality. And, you know, but the problem is it's, um, it, what we want isn't always, it doesn't always align with what's real. Right? Yeah. And, there's a, there's a givenness to our bodies that we have to reckon with. Yo, thanks for watching. You can watch the entire episode on YouTube if you want. You can listen to it at The Matt Frad Show by subscribing on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And feel free to support me, patreon.com slash mattfrad.